for us to read, starting at verse number 27. John chapter number 10, verse number 27. Jesus speaking here. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Verse number 30. I and my Father are one. As I began uh, some time this week and began to look at this passage, it really struck me about the Father's hand. And I'd like to talk this morning about the topic, In His Hands. In His Hands. We find here that Jesus is speaking about those which are placed in His hands, in the hands of the Father. No man can pluck them out of my Father's hands. I began to think, what is a Father's hands like? What are the hands of the Father like? And I think of this, whenever you have a newborn baby, and that Father holds that baby and holds it very closely, they feel safe. You're always told that the, when you hold it very firmly, very very comfortably, they're safe. They feel safe and they're warm and it calms them. Uh, you also think of a child who may be afraid of something and they're, and they're faced with a fear, whether it's in a lightning storm in the middle of the night or somebody's told them a story or something has happened and they run to their father, they run and they find their safety in the father's hands. And I believe that this is the way it ought to be with us as earthly fathers and as earthly parents. There ought to be safety in the hands of the parents. But I would like to point out that today in our Father's hands, those of us who are born again believers in this room, in our Father's hands we also have safety. We also have that <coughs> security. But I think about this, about the hands of the Father who has to go out and uh, many times, especially years ago, when, uh, many people would have to do physical labor. They'd have to go out and their hands would be very, uh, uh, with a lot of, uh, what do you say, not scars, but wow. the calluses. Thank you very much. The calluses from having, you know, I'm not that those in a long time. <laughs> because I didn't even know. I used to have them. Okay. But now I've got a nice little desk job, okay? You don't get calluses out people sign papers. That way. But uh, I used to have calluses working with my hands and, and, and you would you would have that. And some people, you, even today, you go shake some people's hands, and uh, especially some of these men who's out there working, and they, they have these calluses, and they have these thick hands, and they're like, how are you doing? You know, here. And you know they've been outside working because they got the grip, like they've been working. They've got their PhD. I've, I've earned that, by the way. Uh, I did that several years ago. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of men have earned that PhD. You know what that is, right? A post hole digger. Okay, I've done that. I've earned a degree. I, I have done that. And uh, so I have that experience. And so you can tell whenever you come across a person like that. They Sometimes the father's hands are not as smooth and not as nice uh, as, as others because they're having to pay the sacrifice so they can take care of their family, which is the way it should be. And uh, they, they ought to be doing this. And I think of the father's hands as it were spiritually, how that God's hands had to be pierced because of my sin. See, just as the Father has to go out and, and, as, and as they go out and they work that day-to-day -day job and their, their hands become hardened and, and as the parents go out and they work and, and they sacrifice, so our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Parents does the same thing. I think of this, the hands of God were pierced so that mine wouldn't have to be. See, there is the, the sin of the world. When sin entered into the world, what came along with sin? Death. So there had to be a penalty, there had to be a payment for sin, and this payment for sin was death. Matter of fact, Exodus chapter number 30, verse number 10, uh, says this, And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of uh, of it, talk about the altar there, once in a year with the blood of the sin offering. So because of sin, there had to be some blood shed. There had to be something that had to shed the blood. 
And it says, uh, the blood of the sin offering of atonement, once in a year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. So you have this idea of sin that has entered into the world, and because of that, blood must be shed. Hebrews 9.22 says that almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission. The Bible talks about how in the life, the blood is the life. And so... Uh, you find here that there must be the shedding of blood. This is what the penalty for sin is. Psalms uh, 22, 16, uh, uh, describing, and you read that whole passage of Psalm 22, you find uh, great prophecies that are fulfilled at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And here is one of them. It says, The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You see, you understand that when a person or when sin entered into the world, there must have been bloodshed, there must be death, there must be, that is what happens when sin had entered into the world. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. Uh, sin, they, they, they were kicked out of that paradise. And they then had to go, and, and even in the, uh, as they were cursed, the, the Adam said, uh, God told Adam, you'll have to uh, work by the sweat of your brow. And, and so sin cause the punishment. There had to be bloodshed. And as a matter of fact, when they were when God clothed them, He shed the blood of a lamb to cover them physically. And then He cast them out of the garden. And there they are. And because of that, you have sin. And you have the penalty of sin and that is death. And God has told us that this is what the penalty of sin is. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death. So someone has to pay that penalty. Someone has to. There has to be somebody who will do this. And this is why Jesus, when you read through the Gospels, came to this earth. Jesus came and His hands, the hands of God, were pierced and He shed His blood and died on the cross so that I would not have to pay for my sin. Just as, a, just as in, in a family and, and in a home, the parent goes out and they work. They don't charge their children rent to live there. I don't charge my 10-year-old so much money to live there. You have to pay. No, I feed them. And those of you who have had teenagers, you know that they have a lot of work. And he's not even he's not even 13 yet. He's already eating me out of house and home. But you don't charge them. You don't say, okay, for every biscuit you eat today at lunch, you have to pay me 10 cents. Right? Has anybody... Well, don't waste your hands. You're made of money. Please. But uh, normally, under normal circumstances, that's not what you would do. Well, child, you ate, you ate five rolls. You owe me 50 cents today for lunch. Uh, no, we go as parents and we sacrifice to take care of our children and to pay the price so that they can have the safety and the security. This is what Jesus did for us. Jesus came to the sin-cursed earth and He hung on the cross in my place and His, His hands were pierced because the penalty of sin is death and someone had to pay that. So Jesus is the one who paid that. And the hands of God were pierced so that my hands wouldn't have to be. So that your hands wouldn't have to be, wouldn't have to shed and pay the penalty of our sins. Not only this, but the hands of God, not only were they pierced so that our hands wouldn't have to be, but the hand of God can save any sinner. Can save any sinner. I think of Isaiah chapter number 59 and verse number 1. Isaiah 59 and verse number 1. You find here Isaiah speaking and God speaking through Isaiah. And you find this passage, and especially in this first part of this verse, it talks about the hand of the Lord. Isaiah 59 and verse number 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Okay? God's hand is able to reach down and to save the lowest sinner. Amen. 
He is able to reach down to the depths of sin, to the depths of despair. He's able to reach down and to save uh, the worst of the worst sinners. He said that it cannot say, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. See, when a lost person cries out to God, he will hear them. No matter what the sins are in their life that they have committed, no matter how bad of a sinner that they may be, God will hear them. And you say, well, that's good for them. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I'm not really done anything majorly wrong, you know, you won't, uh, you know, I've not stolen uh, something that's been able to be put in jail, or, I, you know, I've never been, never been there, I, I hear that all the time, but we forget about in James where it says if you've even broken even the smallest of the commandments of God, you're guilty of them all. Well, I'm not that bad of a person, it doesn't matter how bad of a person somebody is, it matters, do you measure up to Jesus, and he was perfect. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, I'm a pretty good person. But are you still falling short of the glory of God? And the best illustration I could ever think of is that of the sewage water. Putting just a drop of sewage water in a purified cup of water. Would you want to drink that water with even one drop of sewage water in there? You know, that's not that bad. It's just one drop of sewage water. It's not like a... You know, when you put the whole cup in the sewage plant water and said, let's drink this. You know, that's gross. I'd never do that. But I wouldn't drink a, drink a purified cup of water with just one drop of sewage water and mix it up in there. I wouldn't drink that either, would you? I would hope not. And that's the same way it is with sin. Well, I'm not that bad. Yeah, but if you have one drop of sin in your life, you're still contaminated. All right. So this idea of God saving anybody... And going to the lowest depths, he can reach lowest depths, but he can also save those that are just religious too. And he can save those who seem to be morally good and who don't end up, you know, uh, in jail every other week or who don't end up in prison or who don't end up with all these different things. And, and you, we can all think of somebody and say, well, I'm, I'm better than so-and-so. I, I, I live a better life than so-and-so. I've not met a single person that can't say, well, I've lived better than so-and-so. I'm a better person than so-and-so. But it's not matter if you're better than so-and-so. It matters, what about Jesus? Do you meet His standards? And He's perfect. If so, you've fallen short. But the good news is that God's hand is able to save you. God's hand is able to reach down wherever you are and is able to save. I think of Psalm chapter number 40. Psalm chapter number 40 and verse number 1. I waited patiently for the Lord and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit and, of, and out, of the, uh, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings and hath put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our God. Many shall sing in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Here we find the psalmist who is speaking about being in this terrible pit, this miry clay, this place that he is stuck in. And God is able to reach down into this pit. You may say, well, I have an addiction, or I have a problem with this, and I have a problem with that, and I don't know if God can deliver me from this. Yes, it's like a miry pit, and we can't get ourselves out of that quicksand. You can't get yourself out of quicksand. You need somebody to help you out of that quicksand. And God is able to reach down to the miry pit of whatever it is that you're facing, and He can lift you out of that. Not only lift you out of that, but He will put your feet on a solid rock. By the way, that rock is Jesus Christ. And He will establish your going. That means He will point you in the right direction. And He will be with you every step of the way. And He will put you in the direction which, which uh, you need to go. So we find here that He's able to lift us out of the mountain clay. Set our feet upon a rock and establish our going. Not only has God's hands been pierced. So that mine wouldn't have to. Not only is God's hand able to save any sinner, but I'm thinking that God's hand is able to save completely. Amen. He's able to save completely. I like this in Hebrews chapter number 7, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. 
He is able to save not just for partially time or for until you sin again or no, he's able to save to the uttermost. See, when Jesus, when God does something, He does it totally, He does it completely, and He does it right the first time. Amen. You'll never find anywhere in the Bible where God had to go back and say, whoops, well, let me go back and correct this. You'll find God's judgment on the earth whenever He flooded the world. You'll find God's judgment and these things like that, but you won't find where He says, oh, I messed up. No, who is it's messed up? It's man. man. It's always man who is sinning and is going away from God. God has never once moved. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is man who goes astray. Right. And he's able to save the other ones. Take your Bibles over to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Verse number 8. The Bible says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it law, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers for, uh, of fathers, murder, mur murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, that was not the passage I wanted to read. But that was a good passage, so I read it anyway. I want to read 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1, verse number 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given, un, uh, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Wherefore I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless I am not ashamed. Why? For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. That sin that I've committed to him, that I have that I have committed, and he has, and I've placed my life in his hand, he is able to keep me. He is able to safely hold me. I like where it tells us and it talks about having immortality, that Jesus brought immortality. He has abolished death. He's destroyed death. That's why we have the ability to have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. You have a choice. Those who are lost, they have a choice to either receive Christ and receive everlasting life or to reject Christ and to suffer the consequences that the Bible clearly lays out, and that is death. It is a decision that must be made. But He is able to save the lowest of sinners. He's able to save the moralist, those that are the most moral of sinners. He's able to save the most religious sinners. You find all throughout the Gospels, he saved, uh, he was able to save demoniacs, he was able to save uh, Pharisees. You find Nicodemus, who many believe he became a Christian. He was a, he was a Pharisee. He was able to save anybody that comes to him. And he's able to keep them. But I think about those of us who are born again. In my Father's hand, I find safety. 
I find safety. Whenever I was a child, many times I'd run to my, my parents and my father's hands and he'd hug me because that's all right. I'm here. You're safe. Many times my children, they'll come run to me when they're afraid of something. And they'll, they'll come running and I'll say, it's all right. I'm here. I'll protect you. It's all right. And the Bible tells us in our passage that we are in our Father's hands. That we are in the hand of God the Father. And He keeps us safe. If you are a child of God, you are safe. You say, what am I safe from? Number one, you are safe from hell. When a person is born again, they have no need to fear hell. No need to fear the lake of fire. Because they are saved. The Bible says that you are in my Father's hand. No man is able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. And He gives us everlasting life. We are safe from hell. You see, you say, well, what does this... I don't understand this. Okay, those who reject Jesus as Savior, the Bible tells us, because we must understand that God is not a God who will just simply say, well, I don't like you today. I'm going to throw you into hell. He's not a God like that. He is a just God. You must remember, He is a just God. He's, he's not like... You ever play games with people and they make up rules as you go? They get on my nerves so bad and sometimes I'm guilty of it, okay? But, I mean, you like, oh, well... And you watch kids play games. They make games up all the time. And as they're playing... What do they do? Oh, you can't do that. That's cheating. Oh, you never said I couldn't do that. No, we're making a rule right now. You can't do that. They make up these rules as they go, and they get everybody else in trouble. God doesn't do that with life. Okay? You look at God's Word, and you, find, you, you firmly find out the consequences of your decisions. You find out. He says, here's what's going to happen if you don't receive me. Here's what's going to happen. You're not going to wake up and go, well, God, I didn't know. You never told me. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And you know he did. There's not going to be a single person that will look at God and go, you're unjust. No, they can't say that because God's told them exactly what will happen. You say, show it to me. Okay? Revelation chapter number 20. Take your Bibles over there. Revelation chapter number 20. Verse number 11. Say, what will happen to those who are not in the Father's hands? Those that are not in the safety net of the Father's hands. What will happen to them? What if, what if a person is watching by Facebook or by YouTube and you refuse Christ? Maybe you're in this room and you refuse Christ and you die. What will happen to you? The Bible tells you. Revelation chapter number 11 and verse, or chapter number 20, verse number 11 and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And it was, oh, so if I'm good enough, I'll get to heaven. I'll be judged by my works. I can... Uh, earn my way to heaven by my works. Here it is. You're judged by your works. Yes, you are judged by your works, but it's only so you can see how short you are because your heart is filthy rag. People say, well, I don't want to, I'm not going to uh, receive Christ. I'm going to work myself to heaven. I'm going to be righteous enough. So they do their works and God says, okay, fine. Let's take a look at your works. Why did, you, why did you donate money to this charity for your own selfish benefit to make you feel better? So that's selfishness. Why did you help so-and-so over there so it would make you look better? So that's selfishness. Why did you do this good deed? Because it helped you out. It's selfishness. It's pridefulness. Your works are no good. So the works are, that you do actually will stand against you when you stand before God at this point. So you find here that they are judged by their works. Verse number 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. 
God's still giving them an opportunity to prove that they're, they've earned their way to heaven. You say, what do you have to do to, be, to, to, to get to heaven? Either be completely perfect and sinless, which nobody is. And you say, well, how do you know? Because your works will prove it. <laughs> or receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's the only way to get to heaven. Since nobody in this room is perfect, then that only leaves. You must be born again. That's the only way to get to heaven. It says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. For the wages of sin is death. This is the death which that verse is re referring to. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life. This is the book which he looks at. If you receive Christ as your Savior. There's different variations of this. But in general, if your name is not found in this book of life. You do not have everlasting life. You are lost. He will call your name. You will have your works here. And then they'll say, well, let's look at the book of life. Have they done enough works to get into the book of life? No. <clears throat> because all of our works are dead. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, well, that is mean and that is harsh. No. You choose a God, you choose to have an afterlife, a, a, uh, after you have died, you have chosen a place where you don't want God. And He gives you exactly what you've asked for. The worst, the worst thing about hell and the lake of fire is not the fire, not the brimstone, is not all that, is that you are separated from God forever. Amen. You say, that is not fair. He's told you right now what will happen if you reject him. How is that not fair? You have an opportunity today, if you're not saved, to receive him. How is that not fair? Amen. Amen. You know what will take place. How is that unjust of God? He is a just and holy and righteous God and He cannot nor will He allow any sin in His presence. And the only way to get into His presence is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because that is what purges us. Amen. That is what cleanses us. But those that have received Jesus as their personal Savior or received God's gift of eternal life. I've already quoted the first part of Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. See, we can't earn ourselves to heaven. We can't work our own way to heaven. We can't be good enough to get to heaven. But we place our faith in Jesus and we realize, God, I am out of your hands. In other words, I am not safe because I am not in your hand. God, I cannot be good enough to be where you are. I cannot be good enough to make it to heaven. God, I don't care if I was raised in a Christian home. I don't care if I've been to church all my life. I've never received you in my own personal life as my own personal Savior. And God, I am not good enough to make it there. I am not good enough to be in your presence. I need you. The only way to get that is through Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. He died on the cross for my sins. He was God incarnate, God in flesh. He became sin for me, took my sin upon Him, died in my place so I wouldn't have to, rose again so He could give me eternal life. And Lord, I can't make that on my own, but because of the grace of God, You've made a way for me through Jesus. So Lord, I repent of my sins, and I turn to You, I repent of trying to work my own way to heaven, and I turn to Jesus to take me there. And when you do that, as the Holy Spirit works in your heart and in your life, when you do that, He says, I will save you. And I will give you a gift. Something you don't deserve, you haven't earned, but I'm going to give it to you. 
and that is eternal life. That's the gift I give you for becoming. Not only does God take our sins away, not only did Jesus become sin for us, but in turn, when a person receives Christ as their Savior, He doesn't just take their sins away, but then He turns and gives them the gift of eternal life. What a blessing that is. And those who are born again, we have that gift. Our passage says, No man can pluck you out of my Father's hands. In John chapter number 10. We find that we are safe and secure in our Father's hand. You ever taken something to play with your children or with any kids? You'll put something in your hand and you'll say, if you can get out of my hand, you can keep it. You ever done that? I've done it before. Maybe I'm just a mean parent, but I do. Like, you can get out of my hand, you can have the quarter, you know. And they're all, oh, they're all, you know, trying to pull it in. They can't do it. See, that's the thing. This is a born-again believer in God's hands. It doesn't matter what Satan does. Now, God doesn't taunt him and say, you can, get, you can have, but Satan's always trying to get you out of his hand. He's always trying to attack, but you're in God's hand. And just as a little child can't get anything out of your hand, neither can Satan. Neither can any person. No man can pluck you out of my Father's hand. Because see, the Bible says he's greater than all. He's greater than all. He's more powerful than the most powerful being that you could ever think of. God is more powerful. When a person receives Christ, they are safe in the hand of their Father. Matter of fact, actually, you're in, you're in the hands of Jesus too. So you're in the hands of Jesus, you're in the hands of God the Father. You've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The Bible calls it being sealed. And you absolutely cannot lose that. You are safe. Now it may be that uh, Corbin is getting to where maybe he can maybe cry once in a while. But listen, not only are you in your, father, in your Father's hand, but he says you're in my hand. So you have two hands. And I know he's not getting through both of my hands. No matter what the world does, no matter what Satan does to try to trip you up and try to make you lose your salvation, it ain't going to happen because you're safe in the hands of Christ. You say, well, does that mean I can sin all the time? It actually does not mean that. <laughs> because you have a father to answer to. Amen. You still have a father that you must answer to. Doesn't mean just because you're eternally secure doesn't mean you can go and, and do whatever you want to. It means you have a father that you will answer to. The book of Hebrews points that out. You will give a, a, an answer if you're a born again believer to your father, but in his hands you are safe from hell. And you're safe when you're afraid. When something comes your way, and you're afraid, and, and something, a trial comes our way, we don't know how to deal with it. We don't know what, uh, how to handle it. And, and Satan begins to place that fear in us. We run to God, and we find that we are safe, even in our times of fear. You say, it's out of my control, it's out of my hands, but it's never out of God's hands. I can't deal with it, God. But you'll find that just because you can't deal with it doesn't mean you're a God can't deal with it. He can deal with every situation that comes your way. As a child of God, you are safe even when you're afraid. You say, what about those who are not a child of God? You have reason to fear. You're not in the hands of God. If you're not in the hands of God, you have reason to be afraid. Because you will die, and when you do without Christ, and you reject Him, you will, according to the Bible, be judged and be cast like a fire. There is reason to be fearful of that. I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to hold, I, I know I'm not hooping and hauling and screaming and all this, but I'm trying to be real straightforward with you today. If you're not in the Father's hands, you have reason to fear. If you're in the Father's hands, you have no reason to fear. You're safe. You're safe. That verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, my children make me, make me sing it to them every, it's a, sing it to a song 
They have a sing to him every night when they go to bed. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but the power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what God, God's not giving that spirit of fear if you're a Christian. That's the devil trying to make you afraid. Right. He's not giving you that. He's giving you the power and love and of a sound mind. That's what God's given you as a child of God. You're safe in his arms. From whatever it is that terrifies you, you are safe. You can rest in the arms of God because you are safe. No matter what you face in life, you can understand and realize that no man can pluck you out of my Father's hands. In my Father's hands I find safety. In my Father's hands quickly I find love. Romans chapter number 8, and I'll finish with this. Romans chapter number 8, verses 35 through 39. The question is asked, who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long, and are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse 38, Romans 8. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate from the love of, Christ, uh, of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. When you're in the Father's hands, you, you find safety. You find love. You are loved. God loved the world so much He gave His only begotten Son that who's going to believe in Him should not perish and have everlasting life. That's for the lost, yes. But when we're in the hand of God, we know that we are never separated from His love. Those of us who are born again, we have security. We have satisfaction. In my Father's hand, I know that He is near. I know that He is near. In my Father's hand, I feel His presence. It's like a child running up and holding the hand of the father just so they know that the parent, the father, is there, is near. You can't be too far from a person when you're holding their hand, can you? And you always know they're near. It's like the song says, Jesus, hold my hand. Why? Lord, I need thee every hour. I need you to be near me. And in his hand, I feel strength. I feel his strength. That he has. But I like this because in this passage in John, Jesus is speaking. He's been speaking of his father. In my father, uh, those that are in my father's hands, don't make a plug out of my father's hands. Jesus is speaking. But Romans 8 15 says, ye are, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So not only is he just speaking of his father, that's good that I can go, that as a child when I was staying at somebody's house, I can run to their dad or their mom or their uh, parent and be safe. But boy, it's really good to know whenever I can go to my own parent and know I'm safe. Not only is Jesus speaking of his father, but here we find that we've been adopted into the family. So Jesus' father is my father. That is the father I, I have. I can claim him and say, you are my father, Abba, Father. And in the hands of God, we find safety, security, strength. Because I've been adopted in the family of God, I'm not just in Jesus' Father's hands, but I'm in my Father's hand. I wonder today, I wonder today, where are you? Sitting in this room, watching via the internet, where are you? Are you... Are you even in the Father's hands? Are you, have you received Christ as your Savior? Or are you still trying to work your way to heaven? Are you still trying to do other things? Where are you? If you're not in the Father's hands, I've read to you from Revelation what will happen. I've been very clear about it. You'll not be able to say, I wasn't told, because you have been. You've been fairly told what will take place. I wonder about Christians. Are you resting in your Father's hands? Or are, you too, are we busy fretting and worrying and, and, and anxious about everything? Come unto me, all you that labor and handle and I will give you rest, Jesus said. So there's no reason for us to be panicking and worrying when we're in our Father's hands. 
Because we're safe. We're secure. We're protected. We're loved. We feel His power, His presence. We find that there's strength. And when we get overwhelmed by the sea of life, when we get overwhelmed by things that are taking place in our life, and we don't know where to go, and you are a born-again believer, you run to God. Because you'll find when you run, you're already in His hands. You'll run into one of His fingers. And you'll say, hey, I'm still in God's hands. You'll, you'll find out that God has got everything under control. So for those in here, maybe you're lost and you need to receive Jesus. Today's the day of salvation, the Bible says. Don't put it off another day. Maybe you're in here and you've been anxious about things taking place in your life, Christian. Don't be. Don't be. Don't let Satan give you that spirit of fear. But run to God. You'll find that He's already there. Already there. Glad you had to close your eyes this morning. No one looking around.